all values. Sure, I think of drawing and personality, but and drawing is a, 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 is the gut for me. You know, good man. Um, but I think in terms of values. So I take my palette, and what you mix on your palette. For instance, you take a white palette for watercolor. What's the lightest thing you can mix? You take a little white, and you take a drop tint of yellow. But it's still basically almost darker than anything on your palette. Whereas if you work with a tone palette, which goes back to the Renaissance painters, they knew that if you're working in an academic tradition, you've got value. So think of this as I do this way. I look at this as my keyboard. And you've seen pianists. I remember watching the great jazz pianist, Art who <coughs> was drawing years ago. And he played key for two like this, 15 minutes improvising. Light, dark, middle tone. I work off the middle. There's a great jazz pianist named Dave Rubeck, who's now about 85. Um, and I was telling Dave, we were talking about Tony Bennett, who paints a lot and is a good pal. And I was telling Dave, I said, well, I'm trying to tell Tony when he paints, think of music. You've got high notes, you've got low notes, and you've got the middle. I said, basically, when Monet painted, that's what I told Dave, he worked off the middle. Those water movies did not stay in the same place every day. He worked off the middle, pulling it together, back and forth. So I work off the middle. I know this is my light, this is my dark, and so think of it as a keyboard, high notes, low notes. And then he comes in and play the piano. Same thing. Um, so what I've got here, basically, this is what I start with. I rarely change it. There may be something where somebody comes in and I want something with a lot more. For instance, be very careful with uh, those volatile colors, the uh, phthalos, the, they're deadly. You get a drop on here and you're gone. You can't get it all. Um, um, I basically start with yellow, red, and blue. Is that simple? Just like a primer books test. By the way, I have John in my studio a palette a little bigger than this of Long Massage. It was the most personal gift I ever got. I got it from a painter who got it from another painter, an English painter. And Paul Burns, who was the artist who owned it, gave it to me, and it was the most touching gift I ever got. The palette's a little bit bigger than this. There are mounds of color, only about six or eight. If you work with six or eight, that's all you need. So if you work with a yellow, a red, except for pastel, uh, different. Uh, you work, I work with yellow, red, and blue, and then I double them. Yellow pale with raw sienna. Cadmium red light, that's a little too orange for me. Uh, and alizarin crimson, two reds. Basically, uh, two browns, burnt sienna, burnt on Two blues, cerulean blue, ultramarine blue, and I use sap green. If you were quick, you'd say, where's the black? Well, I told you before that I was very fortunate to have uh, known a lot of artists through the years who had studied with Henry, who had studied with Hawthorne, who had worked with Sargent. And I found with all of them this consistency. They work with a very limited palette. Soroya's palette was not much more than this. And often people say, where did you get that? Oh, where'd you come from? <laughs> often people say, where'd you get that wonderful dialect? Well, I don't know. It's just, you, it's all color values. Something you, there's no such thing as a wrong note in music. All it means if you hear a note, you say that's a wrong. The person's put the note in the wrong place. The note itself is good. There's no such thing as a muddy color or a bad color. It's all value, color value. Color value, and by that I mean related to light or shadow. If you break down color values to this, is what you're painting related to light, to shadow, or middle tone? And where the two meet are edges. And that's what that whole school of, that Sargent came out of, from France Halls to Velasquez, is edges, color values, moving transitions. Uh, when I was teaching at the league, Sargent became discovered by another generation after being put down for 30 years by the critics. And I used to say to my class, don't look at the portraits. Look at those portraits. You get the way it's meant to flow. Look at the landscape. It was a brilliant landscape. Brilliant. Uh, anyway, with that in mind, now let me concentrate. So I'll take any questions you've got later. I'm using a, I'm experimenting a little bit. I've got two mediums that I worked with Jack Richardson on. Not commercially for me, but just I found that medium is important for me, and I think it's somewhat like a diet. The best example you can give is don't, don't use too much. Uh, but I do find I need for a demonstration a little different quick drying medium because I want to get the 
Uh, and I always tone my canvas because why? Well, we put this, I'm not sure, I may have to adjust certain things here because I'm not sure if this light is going to reflect too much. I only put this light on for you so that you can see it up here. But it may reflect too much. Anyway, I've got a quick drawing medium here because I want the painting to get moving a little more quickly. So again, uh, for what it's worth, this is not what you should do. It's what I do. Keep your palette simple. I say the only <coughs> difference probably in a palette, as I see it, is pastel. Um, I will end with uh, values with one more quick story. John Silber, who was the president of Boston University, was in a documentary made about me, and he said Kinsler talks all the time. If they put duct tape on his mouth, he couldn't paint. <laughs> I was, I was I'll, I'll run a second. I was asked years ago by Joe Singer, who was doing a book on pastel portraits, which is out of print but around, him, if I would like to contribute a pastel portrait to one of his books. <laughs> And I said, Joe, I've never worked in pastel. It doesn't appeal to me much. Um, I don't think I can handle it. And he said, well, wouldn't you like the challenge? Well, that's like someone looking at your palm and saying, you're impetuous. <laughs> well, of course. So I called about five artists, pastel artists I know. Every one of them suggested everywhere from 100 to 300 colors. It actually blew me away. And I thought to myself, I was doing a head of a writer named S.J. Perlman. And I thought, I'd play around with this. I took it. Now, do you think, have you ever seen white pastel paint? No way. I've judged the pastel show often, nationally, New York. I never saw one pastel come in on white paint. For the reason I told you with watercolor. If you take yellow, light yellow pastel, it's still going to be darker than the white paper. So pastel paper is just what you say when you're painting or you're looking for a piece of clothing. I want something, a pastel shade, which is not far off from what this is. I've just toned this. I don't care if it's brown, gray, blue. It's a value. It's a, a light middle tone. Same as my palette. So I can relate the two. I mix something here. I can sense what it's like there. And so I thought to myself, I said, well, now wait a minute. The board itself is a value. So I bought just what my palette was for morning. A couple of light chalks, a couple of dark chalks, and a couple of middle gray green. And now, I'm not saying the head was good or bad, but I will say this. You put it on the cover of it. Well, no, I learned something from this. Um, it doesn't, I'm not saying it's going to work, let's say you're doing landscapes, and if you have the skill of a certain pastel artists like Dan Green, he can pick up one of 400 colors and hit it. But I'm saying you will learn more, I believe, by keeping it very simple and thinking in terms of is it too wide or too dark? But basically, that's what it comes to. Now, I cannot talk to you about drawing, or the value of sketching. Um, you can talk about that. Well, we all know how important that is to, to your development. And I've often asked if something looks good to somebody, where did you get that from? Where did you, the John Wayne, where did you get that feeling of the skyline? I said, well, that's, that was from coming painting landscape in Portugal. I used to go out every morning, Dawn knows what this is, you go out every morning and I found we were talking after I knew it was yesterday. The danger is looking for a spot to paint. That can destroy me. What I used to do, Susie's, I'd go out every morning at 5.30, and I'd give myself half an hour in Portugal. So by 6 o'clock, if I hadn't found something, I would stop. And you know what that did? It forced me to paint cactus, tree stumps, and I will tell you something that happens. I was talking to Toby about this morning. What happens when you're painting that exhausts you. It is really a religious experience. You get totally in, 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 engulfed in the passion of an intelligence of understanding if you have a cactus leaf like this and the needle's going this way, that sun's coming around, the way the cast shadow is it. So, so much is just using your hand. So much I found when I was teaching. I'd look at someone and say, you really see that ear over here? Oh no, I was going to get to it. No, you don't get to it. You look at it right away. Now, I'm going to start, but I will tell you that what happens with demonstration, unfortunately, everybody's attitude is, does it look like it? The nose is too big. I, I, no, I understand that. Uh, I keep in mind, I mentioned this for you who might be interested in painting people, portraits. Uh, likeness is an ephemeral thing and can be directed and changed. If you get the structure of your sentence, you go back and puncture it. If my head feels solid, if it feels like it's got um, good color, I can go back and shorten the nose, straighten them out. But if it's the reverse, I've got the features in place, you can't loosen it up and get the character. So I go initially for trying to get something maybe that's sculptural. 
And then I may find very often when I'm painting somebody, see them the next time, like, oh, this old little lady was recently about 40, and I started the painting straight on. It felt pretty good. And then she turned. I was telling you this to paint. She turned and I said, I got that profile. It's extraordinary. Now, when you meet artists and they're all sunny, and I have no respect for them, well, I'm only getting paid for such and such. They will listen to me no matter There's always got to be time to do what you want to do. The danger of portraits, great danger, is you get into a business of painting people and they're going to react emotionally. I'm sometimes amazed that I stay uh, trying to really have people come in. You never know. Sorry, this great remark was the portraits is a painting of somebody with a little something wrong with their mouth. Well, the human head, okay. Jim the hairline. Jim the hairline is nine inches, roughly. Someone's got hair up here. Roughly nine inches. Within that framework of the skull is like this. I have seen children come in who are gorgeous. The parent, whom they look just like, is home and vice versa. The characteristics can change a sixteenth of an inch here. But that's lightness. If you get the feeling, final story. Then I am going to start. Final story. And I mentioned this in the name drop, which is stupid, tasteless, pompous, unnecessary. Uh, but if I tell you Bill Smith, you won't know who Bill Smith is. But if I tell you John Wayne, you get an image. All right. I went out to paint John Wayne. It was a singular experience. I can talk about that, but I'm not going to. I'm talking about lightness. And I went out there and spent the day with him, and I sketched him, and I became very observant. As I told you, I'm an actor. I may know the play, but suddenly I'm asked to perform in it. I read my lines. I do my homework. And so suddenly John Wayne, who is very familiar with me as a moviegoer, became a victim. And I began to study everything. I could feel when his shoulder was up against me, the weight, bigness of his mouth. And I thought at first I'd try him in profile because it was dramatic. But I couldn't, John, I couldn't make, I couldn't make that portrait work in profile because I had to do a three-quarter and it just, I couldn't make it work. Another page of mine, I couldn't. So I went back to the floor. And I noticed certain characteristics. Always stood this way. Not heroically this way. He was big. And here I am. And he was 72 years old. His teeth were crooked. His eyes were tiny. His nose was not close. He wore a toupee. And I said, at one point, we were outside in his home in Newport Beach. And I said, Mr. Wayne, sir, what do you have? Motion over to Rich Nuno, who was the assistant director of the Cowboy Museum. He said, Rich, walk, what's the request of the director? Rich, walk over there to that gazebo, reach in behind the door and bring me the hat. So, put it on. That was the hat that he wore in Fort Apache. And, uh, stagecoach wore all through his career. And he put the hat, it was about this far from him, holding my hand. And he was standing out and said, he looked 72. And we had breakfast together, talked. So. And I was just my head going this way, and he stood out there and put the hat on. And I looked at him and I said, he said, how's that? And he stood there. He said, he's wearing a brown polo shirt. I said, I've got a wee wee. Yeah. I said, i got to go to the bathroom. I got so excited. I said, oh my God, this is John. <laughs> <laughs> what, happened, well, what happened, John, was suddenly the shadow went across here. The hat was like this. And suddenly it was transformed and 20 years washed away. Well, the point of my story was this. I got made ske pencil sketches, drawings. All of this was my notebook, my journal. I went back and made little notes. Careful of this, watch that. And my training was really as a comic book artist, where you went from a book artist. How do you tell that story in its most simple manner? A set, set designer said to me once, he was the best there was, Rob Edward Jones. He said, when an audience constantly applauds the set, the scene designers done a disservice to the playwright. If you get a strong play in the, in the audience's mind, you should be able to remove piece by piece every bit of background. And that's the way I try to think as a painter. How can I remove it and get back to this? And not lose, which is why you step back when you paint, why you use a mirror when you paint, why you get a good night's sleep. So I had the painting in New York, and I looked at it, and I was all set to send it out. And you can imagine, I was a little bit nervous is not a bad word, but concerned. The hair I was sending a painting out was going to be seen when I wasn't in my studio. I said, I have more confidence, Steve, in my studio when someone comes in. I'm right there. I said, what do you mean by that? Let's try that. I've taken an eye out, moved this, or said, no, I can't do that. It's going to change the character. 
Always keep in mind the county. Always keep in mind the county. Likeness is a um, I looked at the portrait, and I looked at the photographs, and I looked at my drawings, and geez, the nose was, the life was bigger, the teeth were behind. Something said to me, don't touch it. It kind of felt good. Felt. Felt. So I left it. Now, was it a good or bad painting? Not for me to say. His son Michael called me and said, you've done the quintessential image in my life. My point was it was not accurate, but maybe it was better than accurate, because it felt uh, so I would say to you, if you're painting a child, as Henry I said, make it a child. If you're painting a, a portrait of someone smiling, make it a smile. Taking a photograph and copying features is not being a portrait painter, is not being an artist. Sargent was an artist. He also painted portraits, not the other way around. So now let me go back to this. And anyway, at some point I'll take questions. Now, I told Jim yesterday, he had a white shirt on, and if he had come this morning with it, it was fine. I said, but if you can pick something, you've got a vest, give me something that, that's my mind going a little bit. Now, this is the size of the canvas. Uh, if you get back up on the chair, and I'm going <laughs> <laughs> to ask your help a little bit. Um, maybe I want somebody to adjust this. Are you comfortable? Not too. I got like three hours. Well, I mean, are you going to be all right if you're sitting there? Because you seem like you're moving around. Um, Always do. Okay. Now, I said to Jim before, well, I've never seen you with glasses. And I said, don't take your glasses off. You're now with me on painting anybody. Um, do you wear glasses all the time? So if I painted you without them, it would be okay? Be better. Okay. Well, you see, if someone said to me, no, I've never seen you without them, then I paint the glasses. It's that simple. That's it. That's the key for me. So let's take the glasses off. Now, I never look for flattery in a, in a painting. I've met people say, well, you have to flatter wealthy people, don't you? No, I do not. I don't think that way. You want to get the character and to get a good painting. All right. Now, this is one angle. Now, Jim, if you turn your head face this way, now look towards me. No, I'm, that's another. Um, one of the things I didn't have all that time to do is to study the light. And I would say, for me, as a quick reaction, either side is, is fine. And again, I use this as a means to get started. My thought will be that after I paint a couple of hours with Jim, I will take photographs of him at this exact angle, plus a couple others. And then when I get back to New York, if I've got a good, strong painting, it won't take much for me to put a comma here, exclamation point there, and sharpen her. You'd be amazed. There, there may be better painters than I, I don't doubt that, but no painter who paints portraits can outdo me on stories of the worst things that can happen. Whatever's <laughs> happening. <laughs> uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes Susie, I tell the story, I said, I don't believe this really happened. Uh, final one, when I was about 22, 23, 25, I, met, I was doing a lot of illustration. I had 10 years of paperback covers, and I was starting to do some portraits, because I always had a consuming interest in painting people. And I remember this lady, Philomena Gates from Georgia, was the most, absolutely most striking woman I had ever seen in my life. Absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. And her husband wanted a portrait of her, and they thought, well, here's a, an artist. Now, you see, for me, the shadowing is a little too heavy. If I had to paint this, I can. I will. But I just want to be able to see into those a little bit and get a little more light on the head. So I think I'm going to ask somebody to maybe help me. Uh, would you? Thank you. Would you maybe just bring the table a little closer to me? Would you? Thanks. Jim, just if you look towards me. And let's see if you can direct. That's better. That's better. Okay, thank you. Now, you may say what I do. I wanted to see, in, not for flattery, but I wanted to see into the, the shadows a little bit. And if you turn away from me, the other way, just go. Hey, six of one, half a dozen of the other. I don't have any strong feelings, at which point I say to myself, let's just get to work. Um, but let me be sure. I'm going to take a couple of shots quickly because I may decide later that I should have done the other way. And let me reiterate this story because it has enormous meaning to me. And you're stuck with me. If you ever compromise and say, I'm not going to do it because I'm not getting paid enough, or I already did you're achieving yourself. And the reason I mentioned this is I felt very healthy when I started this painting of this woman, and she was very pleased. I kind of liked what I did, 
and I saw that profile, I couldn't get it on my mind. I did two paintings of her, and I gave her the second one. I showed him the first one to her and her sister and brother who were paying for it. I wanted to see how they reacted to it, and they liked it. I said, let me show you the second one I did also, which was the profile. And they liked that almost as much as it was yours. Who benefited? I did. That's it. Don't ever shortcut it. Don't ever say, I'm only getting paid for such and such. You are going to pay the price for that. And if you're lucky enough to make your living as an artist, that's something you know. You have no idea, but think about it. 90% of the people I paint are coming to me, or at least were, uh, because they're being retired from the profession. We see. And they would say to me, some of them, what, uh, what happens to you guys when you get to retire? Hey, I'm 85 years old, I don't know. I get up every day and go to work and I can't wait, and I'm busy. I get a little more tired. <laughs> now, let me tell you another thing that you should think about with, with, with color values. If you look at Jim where he is from here now, if you'll notice behind him, if you're at my angle, that there is a dark value. Notice I didn't say blue, red, or purple, but that his hair is almost the same value as the background. Now, if you take a white sheet behind him, it's going to make his flesh darker. Values. Now, I want to stay with that because I sort of like what I see, I'm going to start from here. And when I'm talking too much, which I am, I am really focusing on you a lot. And let me just take a couple of shots. Uh, this is a, just a reflex camera. One of the things I do when I paint, I'm talking for myself. Everything I'm talking about is what I've, when I did my first book on portraits, I told the publisher, I said, I cannot write a how to do it book. I don't believe in it. I don't believe in teaching portraiture. He said, no, we just want to know what you do. So that's pretty much what I go by. So technically, I'm doing pretty much what I do in my studio. Except I spend a lot of time with that person saying, I think I'll paint it from here. But not for flattery. Not to make them look better. But for instance, um, I mean, again, I'm taking names because you can think of the, you can think of the person. Years ago, I painted Paul Newman and went to Connecticut where he was. He was then about 60. And I was kind of disappointed when I saw him because blue eyes didn't look too blue to me and he looked 60 and he had little purple veins in his nose. Very light, very appealing, lovely man. And I had enormous regard and respect for him. I took photographs of him at the time and I got back to New York and had them developed. This guy was gorgeous, meaning the camera liked him. The camera liked him. So I did the first portrait of him. He was in the National Portrait Gallery, head sketch. And I focused a little bit on his blue eyes, which were quite characteristic. He was a great looking head. But then I did another portrait of him, like the girl I told you that I didn't profile, you know, where his eyes were in shadow, you couldn't see the blue eyes. I like that head more, it's got more character. So this, what am I talking about? I'm talking about studying. Miss Hepburn said to me, and I did not have the easiest time with it. She turned to me and said, you know I like you. And I said, well, that's very nice, Miss Hepburn, I like you too. And I said, no, I, you do your homework. Well, I do. I made hundreds of studies of her pencil until I arrived at work. And I finally arrived at a painting, which seemed to be the consensus in everybody's opinion, including the National Portrait Company, and Miss Hepburn, that was the painting. And the truth is, in the painting, you cannot see the color of her eyes. A big straw hat covers her hair. But everybody knew it was happening. And that told me something. So keep in mind, whatever you're painting, if it's a child, make it feel like a child. Uh, there, it's more difficult to paint children because it's so delicate. Much easier to paint men with white hair and mustaches. <laughs> okay. Drawing is very important for me, but drawing is really proportion. Now, it may be that in starting this, I may find at some point, the one thing I want to check on is I'm not, we added this ready for you so that you can see this better. I'm not sure how much it's going to glare. Again, my palette is pretty much like this. I keep to, I've got turp here to clean my brushes and a little of this Kessler medium that Richardson makes. It's kind of a fast drying liquid. You okay? Right, I'll ask you a favor. As you are right now, and I look away, what do you see behind me? No. Okay, just keep your eye on that front. Now again, I'm taking advantage of this. I can't move that background. I don't want to take Jim off the stand. The background is darker than the head. So I'm a value painter. And I say if the 
the mountain is, you know, the mountain that's in the distance at Blue Gray, it's a value. You get on top of that mountain and walk up to it and the leaves are green. The distance. So you've got to, it's always a learning process. And boy, there are no shortcuts. The one thing I'm still a little troubled with, I want to see if I can get a little more light, Jim. You're fine. On this for a little bit. I just want to open up, uh, that's fine. I'm just taking a little blue, make believe this is charcoal. I'm just taking a little green blue to, to, to mark it. Another thing I was taught years ago, great advantage. I didn't do it so much here. Always keep a little extra canvas when you stretch it. Because as a cameraman, photographer will tell you, you can crop, can't you? You, with a phone, you can. So if you've got the head too far here, you just take it off and move it. Always leave a little extra canvas up and down. You can see with two or three strokes, I've really caught the essence of this man. This is a single prime linen canvas that I use a lot. Uh, when I go out to do landscape field sketches, I like boards. The only thing, if you're painting landscape out of doors, as Dawn will tell you, it's very good to get a, something behind it or the sun can shine through. These are the great frustrations. But you can see how quickly I catch it with the light is. <laughs> See? <laughs> Trust me. Okay, so I have a feeling of where I want to place it on the canvas. Now, supposing when I'm through, I wish I had another. I've got, or did, would normally have extra canvas. Don't, because you feel it's too close to the top, and you've got a good start, leave it. Stay with your painting, but leave extra canvas. You can do now, my idea would be to take advantage of this part of his head. I'm glad, he's, for instance, you think of something like the vest. For me, rather than the flat, tacky color, that will give me a chance to do a little flair and style. But keep this in mind, do not invent things for your client. Do not put a pocket handkerchief in if they don't wear it. Do not put, it sounds like small. You can improvise a lot, but be careful that it stays within the character. One more story. And when I was painting landscapes in Portugal, one of the beauties of that landscape were these great rocks that went down to the ocean. But you couldn't, in a painting, describe the scale very easily. They just looked like rocks and water. And as I was painting, I noticed occasionally people would walk across the beach. What I did was, towards the end of the canvas, I put in one, two, three figures. You got the scale. That's different. It's within the character. They had been there. Uh, I remember painting certain portraits of people. I remember when I painted Elizabeth Dole, she was president of the Red American Red Cross. And her office, I was painting her secretary of labor. There were lots of flowers in the office, but I wanted to show her as a professional woman. And when I did the portrait of her sitting at the desk, there was nothing behind it but a bare wall. I put the flowers in from over there, but it was within the character of the person. So if you go out and you study what you're painting, you get a feeling of the land. When I was painting in this area, I did workshops, I used to go out and sketch all around the So I got a feeling of what the the sage was, when the, 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 the color became a little bit reddish, when it was, where it was burned off by the sun. So, you, so when you're painting one picture, somewhere you have in your mind a feeling of that place, time, experience, weight. Good. The other thing I do, I'm not saying you should, when I'm painting, this won't surprise you, I read, not do I keep talking, but I get the subject talking, A, because it interests me, and it keeps, just as you're doing, suddenly keeps ahead head animated. I'm now mixing in, uh, again, you know what my palette is. I'm just taking a little burnt sienna, and I'm staying off the palette, but I'm still concentrating very much on my drawing and my effect, and I'm just mixing the paint up a little. It's, it's fluid.
Now my palette, you can see this is all middle tone I'm working with. <laughs> the other thing I would suggest to you all when you're painting landscape, don't take your mind off the entire picture. Don't just paint a tree, but when you paint the tree, keep thinking of its relationship to the sky, to what's around. Now what I'm also trying to do with this is preserve as much of the canvas before I cover it. You see I'm going into a darker value. You say, what's the color? I don't know. I'm just taking a value. You get your values right, this is the this is the most profound thing I can say. If you can understand values and get your values correct, you can learn color. If you look for color and forget values, forget it. Again, get the values, the degree of light and shadow, you can get color. And one of the things that's happened here is, I don't know, did you tip my There are a lot of conflicting lights that bother me, like the light on the forehead up here. Um, but let's just stay with this and see. Now, the other thing I found, and I won't get to test this yet, the human head is roughly, I find, as a, look, these are generalities. I find that the human head, when I painted a man, I keep about life size or larger. When I'm painting a woman's head, I keep it slightly under. Now, Right? Thumb to pinky's my hairline. Stay within that from time to time. But if you paint a man's head, you're better off going a little larger. What about children? Uh, I find going a little bit under life size or like keep keep them slight keep women and children slightly about life size or smaller, but men you can go over. Again, drawing becomes very important to me. You notice I didn't say likeness, drawing, structure. So I want to keep my cameras from here, and I definitely think I want to put in this behind it. So somewhere I've got my plan. I definitely do not plan to put any of this. I want to keep it this way. There is a very bad reflection from this, which I don't get in my studio, but it's just I guess it's better for you. I'm hoping also where I can to make use of this tone of the canvas. The other thing is I find I, I like mixing into my soup. But when I do this, I know this is related to shadow. You wouldn't know this, but at the moment when I put that in, it's got a little blue. Technically, for those who are here, the, the reflection here is awful. But you'll see it better, but it's, it's, it does not please me. I'm getting reflection here from this right into the. Let me show you something quickly. No, I won't work. You won't see it. Let me, I just want to show you that. Uh, I don't know where this is controlled. Oh, huh? Better? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. That's better for me. <laughs> But on the other hand, I really feel it's a little long. I don't know if it's picking up on there. No, I don't agree. Let me turn it. Let me turn it on. You can time. do that lighter, ever. Huh? Do that lighter. Just do, do your work. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> People tell me what to do. No, I can handle this. Let me try it this way. I'll tell you why. <laughs> no, I think you know, truly, I think you see the color. 
You can? Well, let me see what happens here. Let me just flaunt this in a little bit. Okay, so I've established a certain uh, pattern there. see the eyes, there are no highlights in the eyes, don't put them in. Just paint the illusion. Okay, I think now I've got it placed on the canvas about where I want it. The value of, if you're taking a black and white photograph of this, the value, value, the value, not color, of this is the same really as this. I can't explain that to you, the same value, slightly different color. If you took a black and white photograph of me painting him, this would register the same as the, the shirt. So I think it's time for me now maybe to lay in a little bit of light on the head. The other thing, fingers are so greasy from the oil. Good. Um, can I ask you a favor point in there? Don't move, sir. Don't move. No, no, don't move. So, could you give me my camera for a second? Certainly. Because you'll notice here and there things change a little bit. Thank you so much. I want to keep it near me. This is what I do in the studio and I'll say, you know, drop your head slightly. Good. That's fine, thanks. I also find I keep one basic, oh, another thing, try and, I shouldn't say what you should do. I try to keep sections of my palette clean for light, shadow, middle tone. I want to mix up a flesh value for the light on the flesh. You can see in my palette quickly, that's obviously related to light. If you ask me what color's in it, there's my palette. Now suddenly that middle tone which seemed kind of light is getting to become a middle tone, the tone of the canvas. That light that's up here for the moment I'm disregarding, I'm not really sure that I want to play with that. 
Now you notice how deeply set the eyes are. That's a very important part of the character. Character. And you notice I didn't say likeness, but the character of the subject. So if you're painting a sunny day and your effect is sun, that's what you want to achieve. A smile, by the way, does not make for a happy portrait. And a sour expression does not make for a bad one. It's the character and whether you're painting has got life. Now, let me talk to you about something technical, only because of the way I'm thinking. I don't know how well you can see this from there or there, but just to give you my way of thinking, I think I have already, in a maybe not a very good way, I think I have established, you get it, is it on or still off? Mic? The mic? I think it's been off. Has it really? Okay. Anyway, as you can, uh, you can't see it there at all, but somewhere there's established uh, some darks, some lights, and if you notice, the half tone is the canvas. And that's, thank you, that's what I'm trying to, that doesn't help at all, Tony. Huh? Oh, batteries, okay. Charge it. It's too late. It's too late. They missed it. Wanna, you want to hear the fastest joke you ever heard? You just missed it. <laughs> hey, see, I, I think what I'm trying to focus on, I think that's better. Is that on now? No, no, still? no Anyway, I'm trying to hold on to that canvas tone as best I can. I would have you think about when you paint out of doors, tone your canvas a little bit. Then you won't be fighting the white. Fair? basically staying within uh, two or three brushes. My brushes relate to the light, shadow, and middle tone. Thinking in terms of values, the light that hits the lid, I see it coming over here. The more you relate your color, music, the simpler you keep it, the more you'll get color. <laughs> he's, make, he's very affectionate, but he makes me very nervous. <laughs> My friend Bill Draper used to start off every one of his demonstrations with a limerick, and one of his favorite was about Titian. <clears throat> and it went, when Titian was mixing Rose Matter, his model sat perched on a ladder. Her position to Titian suggested coition, so he climbed up the ladder and had her.
I think you can see where, to me, the idea of adding the best, I didn't pick the best out, Jim did, but it gives a little more fun to, when you're painting something here, where else does it appear? If you're painting a light there, is it the same here? Keep relating color values. So I'm taking some of the same blue value that's here and introducing it there. Now, well, let me hold back on this one. At this point, I am asking myself, do I really need that background behind it? And the truth is, I really don't, but I want to introduce it. That is better. The sort of thing I want to try now, I'm not really sure of, but I want to try it. I'm just taking some soup off the palate, the flesh, and I want to see if I can. Darker, darker. I'm not trying to mix color, match color as much as match values. trying to create an effect rather than match. And some of it is, I was wondering if I should bother with it, why I bother, whether it would help me to have the background, but I want, I think I want that challenge. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see the shadow side of his head is lighter than the background. And I'm not sure that's what I want to do. This kind of medium just affords me to keep it thin. <coughs> keep the paint thin without losing the richness of the color.
See, actually, right now, the, the, the lightest light is right up there, up here. And I'm trying to hold off, but I don't think I, I think I better stay with what the effect is. I'm curious, um, where is my friend? The mold. Hey, would you do me a favor? Well, maybe that's what, if you come find me, if you come find me, I'll get in the room. I know something. That's better. Thank you. That's okay. So the reason I did that is that I was getting that reflected light and it, for me it was at least throwing me a little bit. And how does that affect all of you watching? Does it matter? Okay, good. If you have any questions, I, I think I can handle it. The other phrase I remember uh, I learned from teaching was not so much repainting as restating. And I can't explain that one too well to you. But so much of it is a matter of going back and reinforcing what you first saw. But see, now there's no question to me the background behind him on the left is definitely darker than the value of the shadow. Do I make the shadow lighter or the background darker? Or maybe it's a little bit of each. I'm going to try and just darken that background and see what happens. Mixing a little blue. Another thing I do as a painter, 
is I rarely use one color straight. I generally mix it in <coughs> with another. I think this I'll stay with what I see in front of me. <coughs> the illusion. I don't know if this strike. Where's Dawn? Right here. I don't know if this strikes you as much, but if you notice, behind you can't see it from the behind his head on the right. The background is darker than the shadow. I could see it from the other side. And it became a question to me: Did I want to? And I think my own feelings stay within the value. Someone is, which I do more often. Than. There's more, you're dealing more with subject and painter than you are with the writing. Now it's clear that that light on the cheek there is a lighter value than what I've got. talk about drawing, and I don't say I'm accomplishing it, but just as a matter of, if you're doing a nostril, ask yourself at the same time, where is the ear? So that you keep thinking overall, whatever you're painting, there's a figure in the foreground, what does it relate, 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 relate. Color is all relation. Yes. Did you like it? How'd that go? I'll tell you about that in a minute. <laughs> uh, I will tell you that. Two or three. Uh, that's a, a good question. Peggy, are you still here? Yeah, Peggy. She's talking. Are you still here? I'm here. Can you handle my mother's story? Oh, yes. Love story. Let me get one more shot. Uh, I'm glad this is happening because it gives you a feeling of what I do. Suddenly I, I notice a little change in the light, the way it's sitting here. <coughs> Drop it. 
got to get this bit. Good. Good. I see, I notice when I begin to focus with them, suddenly I begin to see the eye and the light in it. But the story about, I'll take one quick break. No, when you throw, I want to get just a couple more things. Oh, why don't you do that for a second while I tell them one story? This place. But do come back. <laughs> Today, uh, when I was elected to the National Academy, it meant a great deal to me because I had been turned down three times. By the fourth time, I really cared a great deal, the first two times I did. But to me, it was becoming a member of an artist society that Sergeant Homer, St. Gordon's were all members. It took on a great meaning to me. And when you're elected to the Academy, the National Academy is 150 years old, the tradition is you give a self-portrait to the Academy. And so sergeants the self-portrait that's there, Chase. And so I was working on a big self-portrait of myself as my gift, don't assume it, my diploma piece to the Academy. My mother, who was then close to 1985, like Betty Davis and maybe smoking cigarettes, she was very proud of me but didn't understand how I made a living, didn't like the way I dressed, my pictures didn't look quite like photographs to her, now, she can say that, but if you said it to her, leave my son alone. <laughs> so she came down one day and she said, what are you working on? And I had this big self-portrait. She said, I want you to see this. What is it? I said, wait till you see it. So she walked into the studio. She said, you know, at first I thought that was you. While Jim's coming back, do you have any couple of quick questions? <laughs> so obviously I need him. Uh, <laughs> so if you have any questions of where I am so far, please. What size, what size is that? What? What size is your camera? 22, 28, thank you. You were mixing your flesh colors, can you just kind of... Beg pardon? Can you, when you were mis mixing the flesh colors, can you just kind of say what you're putting into his skin tones? Can yes, I'll tell you this very red? quickly. It's all color values. I start not what colors I put in, what is the degree of light or shadow. So in my flesh tones, there's alizarin, yellow, and white, period. But you put too much alizarin in and a little white, you're getting a shadow. And I think what you've seen me do is to take this blue that's here. Doesn't bother you, does it? The value's right. So I work in terms of values. That's what Monet did. That's the whole the French Impressionists, particularly Monet, worked with color values. Sir? When you're working one-on-one, -on -one, there's no audience. Do you carry on the conversation? Constantly. Yeah, and it's better for me because then you see the subject is stuck with me, it's focused on me, and I look for little expressions. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the approach is the same, it's just that I don't have anybody behind me. Have you gotten that from Jenny? Beg pardon? Have you gotten that expression from Jenny? That expression? Oh, no. no. <laughs> uh, well, just think of it from this standpoint. How much painting time do you think I've done so far? Painting. painting. 20 minutes, maybe? Good. Mm -hmm. See, what I didn't see before more um, is I didn't have that degree of light and shadow on the head and it began to bother me I was getting too much features you want the character and suddenly now you see I'm getting more where that light is in there and what affects drawing is suddenly you come down here and you say well that light travels there don't move, don't move. Go, don't move. You see, now suddenly, although it's not the time to do it, I can begin to see the color of his eye. I said color. I couldn't see it before, it was all in. But my own approach to it is to save your punctuation to the very end and to just get an overall feeling of proportions. Now, for instance, here's a case in point. Who was it who asked about the flesh colors? That part. Now, if you look at the side of his forehead, 
and you see it goes into the hair, I say to you that that is a color change, not a value change. So if you take this and put it in here and go back into some bit of the, the grayness that's under there, you feel it in there, and it becomes part of You've got to connect it. Values, values, transitions, okay. edges. You would work this the same as a oh, Sorry, I just need a little louder. You would work this the same as a landscape, would you? Yes, exactly. Who said that? Morton. Morton. Exactly, Morton. Exactly. Go the big shapes, and then you want to pick up a rock, pick up a building. But you don't start with the building of the rock, do you? You start with the effect. Effect. So I've decided this was the key for me in this painting so far. I want to see if I could hold on to the background. I couldn't. I need that dark around the head to work this way. The other thing I, I will stress again that I do a lot is this business of one of my favorite lines more. When I was studying with Wayman Adams, I was 17. Mr. Adams had been a star pupil of Robert Henry. And Robert Henry wrote what, in my opinion, is the best book on art ever written to a painter, called The Art Spirit, which you can still get, published in 1929. And Mr. Adams was not a flamboyant teacher. He was a flamboyant painter. But he'd walk around very, very quietly, and he'd say little things. I'd be doing this. He'd say, young man, when you paint the hair, make believe you've got a comb. Don't just put hair, comb it. Follow. Then it begins to feel like something. The other thing I have not talked about much were edges. And I cannot stress to you how important edges are. Yes, I, I, I like Morton's question a lot. It's exactly the way I approach landscape. Same palette. Now, I don't know if there's really any point in suggesting the color of this because it's the same value, but maybe. Will you leave off things like... I'm sorry, a little louder, so... Yes, will you leave off things like molds and wrinkles and stuff like that, if that isn't part Great of the question. Great question. Great question. Do you have any molds or wrinkles? <laughs> You do now. Uh, yes, let me, that's a, a good question. Let me think I've right to that. One of the things I started to say to you just a moment ago was I suddenly look, now look at Jim's how that right eye, suddenly I begin to see into it. If you start out with that, then you're starting out with detail and trying to, once you get everything in place, and then I find with the subject as I begin to get into it, I begin to see more. Remember Seymour? Lovely fellow. <laughs> I love this area. It's got a lot to do with the character of his head. Once you get that established, then you can go into the color of the eye. I think another thing, John, I don't know how you feel about this, but I find introducing new color within the values is very important. And that's what makes it fresh. As long as you get your values, I think you can just 
So I find with the shadow, once I was a background too light or too dark, because you can go two ways, ha half full, half empty. Once I began to say this is about as dark as that this then can come up in light, and you introduce new color. But again, it's with the same palette. It's all batteries. Now, if I had just, if you study his eye, and you go to the right side of the eye, I can see that, and this is where lightness comes from. If you look at the right side of his eye, and the structures go into the forehead, there's really almost a very subtle transition, which is the bone. And I would say to you, if you don't see something there, don't put it in. Unless it's something that helps, and I stay with this one word, the character of your subject. In other words, as he suddenly looked up, I began to see a little glint in the eye. But you save that to last. Do I put in, yes, I do, so I put in what I see at this distance. Not at this distance. So yes, eventually, it's really like punctuation. You don't, you put the structure of the tree in, then the leaves. You don't start with the leaves and build into a tree. If you get the structure of your tree, then you can be able to decide selectively. And that's the danger of working with a photograph. The photograph has told you, put this in and you copy it. That's not the answer. That's, then you're copying photographs. So what you get to now uh, are what I call very subtle differences. I'm sort of inclined not to muck around with the, I sort of like the idea of maybe leaving this. Yeah. Was that Dawn? Yeah. <laughs> What'd you say? I'd say that was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Two points. <laughs> Everything, um, now I'm sort of tempted to see if I can come up even a little lighter in the shadow. I'm taking off my palette, it's a middle tone, I'm not sure. And if you say what color it is, I don't know. I just know the value. And I think I can afford to, to make this a little more luminous. I think what I have found happens, for those of you who are interested in painting, people. If you get your structure, you get your proportions in the right place, and keep your painting fresh, a likeness will evolve. It really will. Because the closer you get to it, the more you begin to question, where does that edge go? But you keep it all together and not go for details. But that's the best way to answer. That's what that's simple to say. I'm going to push this a little bit. It's more than I see, but it feels good. Okay. You don't see it from there, but when you come up and see it, it'll, it'll make sense. It begins to change the expression and give it more alertness. And so it's not flattery, you just want to get something to look alive. There was a wonderful story about Sargent and uh, the great theatrical family, the Barrymores. And in 1920, about five years before his death, Sargent said, no more portraits. He'd had enough. But he did a charcoal drawing of Ethel Barrymore who was the leading actress of her day, and gave it to her. And she, someone asked her about it, and she said, well, so, and they said, I understand Sarge has done a portrait of you. She said, yes, it's me minus the likeness. <laughs> <laughs> However, later on, as she got older and began to appreciate what he was and the beauty of the drawing, she used it as her official, one of the most, well, let me, let me say something. I'm saying to you a very important part of painting Jim, I would say the eye is very difficult because it's very, very subtle. 
And to get that character, of that eye, I think you have to be very, very careful. And if the other eye doesn't show in there, my feeling is that don't go for it. Leave it alone. That's something about as far as white of their eyes, there's no such thing. There's a difference between light and highlight. My wristwatch, where it picks up a glint, that's a highlight. The light on the end of those is not a highlight, it's a light plane. Light planes are connected, highlights are isolated. So you save your highlights as much as you do. Uh, Describe what you did with, with accents, with wrinkles and more. There's some detail on that jacket. I will get to that towards the end of the painting, where I want to suggest maybe a little more of the structure of that jacket, that it has a, a lapel. Not in the beginning. Another thing that I do, when I say I do it, it's a certain tradition of painting, is I paint heavier in the light areas and thinner in the darks. And there's some very practical reasons for that too. But let me just say that's what I do. So I'm loading much more paint on here. You okay, Jim? It seems to me as you begin to develop a painting this far, you begin to see many more value changes, but very subtle. For instance, I don't see any difference between the shoulder here and the background. I really don't, but I'm going to play with that. some advice, uh, I would say, these again are generalities, I would say if you're going to paint landscape, try and work with the tone canvas, unless you're doing watercolor. I'm not looking for shortcuts, I'm just trying to find ways to simplify what you look at. And eventually you're going to have to cover that white canvas. You see, things that I don't have the ability to do quickly is, you know, it's the characters right here. And I will tell you this as a painter. Everything's exciting to me. The jacket, the gear, everything becomes more. The more you paint, the more things you will see to paint. And the more you'll understand, the more you understand, the better you'll paint. Okay? Okay, let me, let me mention something that occurs to me now. If I had to stop now, I would be comfortable for this reason. Am I satisfied with it? No. This is about the way I left my painting of George Bush. I mentioned that because I referred to it earlier. I took it back, and I would say this has all been done from life. I then take my camera and say, well, you know, there's a little light in the eye there. There's, this ear should be fuller. And that's where I use my camera. That's all. You see what Jim did when he pulled his arm back that way? That's what happens to me when I'm painting. If someone does that, and I say, boy, there's my portrait. There's my portrait. Do you, on your finished painting, do you do a whole new painting? I'm sorry, just a little louder. I'm sorry. Uh, for the final edition, the final painting, are you going to refine that or do you do a whole new painting? Would someone repeat the question? 
Are you going to when you do a final portrait from this? Are you going to do it on? This? No, this is going to be my final. I'm sorry. This will be my final portrait. Sorry about that. See, as Jim begins to smile, you begin to notice little different lines, and you, you can introduce them. And by drawing, I mean you then begin to correct certain things, like I look at the outline of his head on the back. I'm still trying to hold that little canvas tone because it's about the right value for the light on his hair. But I would say, if I were to describe my own work, I would say that I paint the whole thing at once. If I'm painting that ear, I look at this ear. If I'm painting that eye, I look at this one. And again, for me, it's a matter of restating. I've just thrown a little sap green into my blue and a little alizarin, which is as dark as I can go. I just want to see if I can pick up this accent there. And the darkest spots, areas, are right through here. And that's important because the structure is the neck. It happens here, there. And basically, I will keep this as my final canvas. I'm, I could change my mind when I see it back in New York, but I've asked happened is that when I stop, Terry's going to take this back to Wisconsin when it's dry, send it back to me. I'll then look at my photographs and then I can decide what I want to hold on to, what I want to lose, what I want to extend. But no, this will be, I have a feeling that if you see the final of this, a lot of this will stay pretty much this way. This probably will be redefined a little bit more. So it has a little feeling of that particular jacket. But I would say from my standpoint as a painter that the values, the color, I'm not sure about the color, but the values are pretty much intact, meaning I can't go any darker anywhere than here. I can't go much lighter than anything but there. But the tendency with too many of us is to break up form. By that I mean they put what I call highlights in the forehead. And I say that if you squint at it, you don't really see it. So paint the illusion. Paint the illusion. And then I find my color, as I begin to get things in order, first I want to go for the lower lip. I've mixed a little light with a lizard. <coughs> and you see, the upper lip is not a hard line. But when I first start to draw, I want to get where the lizard is. <coughs> I think one of the geniuses of Sargent, more like any painter I would be, he could hit those color values right off. Right, amazing. Are you nervous when you do people like presidents? Hey, pardon? <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I find I never get nervous. I get impatient. I get, um, don't mistake me for being cocky. I take nothing for granted, nothing. I have done maybe 2,000 commission portraits. When a client comes to see the portrait, even if it's something I've done for friends as a gift, and the fellow at the switchboard calls me, <clears throat> Mr. Kinsler, your guests are here. To see the, they're here to see the painting. I have a long <coughs> Susie that's from here. It's through the block, from 19th Street to 20th. 
I always go down and greet the people, unless they're close friends who know the way up, because it's a long, intricate way through the club. And I walked down, and I remembered a movie with an actor named Chester Morris called The Last Mile, and he's going to the electric chair. <laughs> and I walked down John the aisle like this, and I say, Kinsler, what are you in for this time? I've had, I've had people who said to me, if you wouldn't paint this portrait, we wouldn't have it done. We want you. Then they'd come to look at the portrait, they'd pick everything apart. Uh, unbelievable. Other people, you don't, you, I never take John for granted because you don't know what people's emotions. You know, if you go to a doctor and he said, look, you, you've got a, a, ble you're bleeding, we've got to cover it, there's no question. But suddenly, um, someone will come in and say, again, there's something wrong with the mouth. I said, do me a favor. Your husband's coming in an hour to see the portrait. Don't tell him what you think before he sees it. As soon as you plant the seed, that's the first thing they look for. Do you know that half the time, maybe more, when the other half comes in, or somebody else is involved with the okaying of it, the very thing they've seen wrong is, well, I really like the way you did the mouth. <laughs> I throw this story out to you only that hopefully maybe one day it may help. One of my first portraits was this Philomena Gates, and I was a young artist, and just started to get into portraits, and Mrs. Gates, this gorgeous woman, wanted me to paint her, and I did. And she was very pleased, her husband was pleased. And I was putting in my first exhibition at Grand Central Galleries. And she said to me she couldn't come to the opening, she had a dinner, cocktail party, but she would be coming a little early. And I got there a little early, and she was walking out, and she said to me, I said, hi, Phil. And she said, you've ruined my portrait. You have no idea, but I think you can imagine what I felt my first exhibition. And I had to stand for three hours greeting people and all my thought. To this day, I do not know what I did after she left for the final portrait sitting. I tweaked it a bit. I don't think I changed it much. I still don't know what. The point of my story is that some, you can guess what's coming. Forty years later, she wrote an autobiography called Confessions of a Rebel Girl. And on the cover, in color, <laughs> if somebody says something like that, they you ruined it or you didn't do this right. Do you, I mean, you know, do you ever ask them why or what? Would you uh, rephrase that a little and have somebody repeat it? I just have a little trouble hearing at this distance. If somebody says you ruined the portrait or you know this is not correct, would you ask? What or why? Oh, sure. Uh, in the case of Ms. Gabe, remember, she saw it at an opening. And I never heard anything further. She just sent it up and she had it at the house for until she died last year. I am always very interested in what subjects say, and that is a question of not compromising, but negotiating and trying to find out. To use the expression of there's something wrong with the mouth, it may be that it's something wrong with the cheek. Because if you think structurally, the head, nine inches, you think of the drama comedy mask, this is what changes. Sometimes a line can be too dark. I said, oh, it made all the difference. I remember watching Bill Draper do a portrait once, and uh, we knew the subjects, and he was finishing it off, and I was with him, and there's uh, something wrong with the eye, and Bill said, you're absolutely right, he took his brush and just painted it out. He agreed. The point is, and that's what I said, maybe it connects with what I said yesterday. If you hear somebody say to you, that's totally wrong, and you don't feel it's right, it's wrong, don't change it. Now with portraits, this is the disadvantage. Uh, but you have a responsibility. Uh, I have very little patience with artists who will tell me what it's, it's, they'll look down at this as a commercial adventure. I am, at this age, I'm still so excited and involved. When I finish it, it's over. I'm on to the next week. That's what it matters. But people sometimes can offer it. See, there's all types of criticism. Uh, and people can say something negative in a very helpful way. Do you really think you've gotten the character of my nose that really was broken once? I don't want to listen to it. You begin to paint and paint and think, is it a good painting? And I get my fellow artists in to see it, and they say, oh, it's wonderful. But then the client comes in, they don't know if it's wonderful or not. They just look and say, but, but the mouth is wrong. Now, if it's something like color, you say you have the color of the eyes, that's, I wish all my portraits happened that way, because to change an eye from in there from blue to gray to green, that's easy. 
It's like changing a comma to a period. It, makes no, it doesn't change your structure. But if someone walks and says, it doesn't look like me, now this all happened to all of us. I wouldn't, my class, I wouldn't know who it was. I, mean, I can tell you stories about this. That I really think you will not believe me. And sometimes prominent people. Because someone has achieved a certain stature doesn't mean they have any more perception or depth or sensitivity. Um, but I weigh everything that's said. Is this helpful or isn't it? Does it make sense? Very often it makes sense. Sometimes uh, you're trying to be kind to somebody uh, and maybe you dip into without meaning to flatter it. And I remember one husband said to me about his wife, he said, you know, she's lived with me 50 years, she's earned those wrinkles. I had taken them out, and he was absolutely right. So these become value judgments in a way, to use the word value again. And how much somebody saying something can have value. Now, one of the things I say I do, I've been very lucky all my life to have had these different artists in my building, from abstractionists to, and they all, we all liked each other. We cared about you. When I look at uh, some of Will Barnett's work, he works very differently than I. And I said, Will, I, I think if I had any value as a teacher, if, it's a big if, is I really tried to sense the personality of the people who were working. So that I would say to Dawn, you need more structure with your drawing. And I would say to somebody next to Dawn, what Dawn does, you look at her work, she's got, you need more sense of color. And I will take a certain degree of pride, because certainly I did care, to get at the gut of what I felt. You see, you see me quickly, I'm doing a quick demonstration. This is what I start with, this is not where I come from. Because if I were working with you within a week, I could see in yours what you need and what you need this. You may not need that, but you may. And so to talk about critiquing, I value it, but I also have to evaluate it on the basis of what the hell does it mean? It's not the way I, here's the, here's the classic one, Jim. It's not the way I see him. I don't know what to do. Or if someone walks in and says, well, the chin is too long, or the ears are too big, that's a no question. You can, what does it take to, to, to sharpen this a bit? Or lose an edge there? But if it doesn't, you say it doesn't, not the way I think of him, what the hell is that matter? I would also be very, I am very careful, I do not do, unlike my dear friend Dawn, whom I value so much, I don't show sketches to clients. Because my sketches may, when I was doing the White House portrait of President Reagan, Mrs. Reagan, for lots of reasons I will not go into, was very nervous about the painting. Not me, any artist who was painting her husband. Reasonable. So I had done some sketches. By sketches, I'm talking about some this big, of a three-quarter figure, sort of based on pictures to get a composition. And the one that I finally used for the final portrait, which was 50 inches, because I had a strong feeling, if you paint President Reagan, get a feeling of outdoors a little bit. Now, I didn't realize that mine was the only one ever painted basically out of doors among the 45, six presidents. I didn't do it for that reason. I felt he had an outdoor feeling about it. So I wanted to suggest it in the formal portrait. Mrs. Reagan came in to see the sketch. This is nothing negative about Mrs. Reagan. This could be Mrs. Smith. And she said, what about the shoulders? Or what about the hands? I said, but Mrs. Reagan, it's a sketch. Oh, no, but, so it's a question to see what people are looking for. And that's why I say I don't really like, I love working with you all, but I don't really like demonstrating for them. They want to see the sketch. Oh, look, he got it right away. But then sometimes I've scraped the whole painting out later. Uh, what interests me a lot with artists are the personality of the artist. So watching Morton work yesterday, or John yesterday, you get a feeling how they're coming at it, and that's what we all are. So what pleases me that you're here, that Susie and John are here, and some of the other artists, because I think we're all curious. I am always interested in how my fellow artists work. Um, so I'm not sure how well I've answered that, but here we are. What is our... I'd like to go a little longer. But you see, a case I give you with values is right here. That if you notice his hair as it goes, you can hardly see it. If you can solve areas like that, you can paint. How does this relate to landscape? The best advice I got at 18 years old from Mr. Johansson and Mr. Dumond is you want to paint portraits, get out there and do landscapes. It enlarges you. It challenges you. Really. As an artist, if, you, if you're healthy, 
If you've got anything here and here, you know there's no end to it. It doesn't get easier. You just get to a point, I think you'll agree, you feel more confident you can solve it. That's all. You okay? <laughs> so in other words, with this painting, my feeling is, it's not ego, I'm just telling you what I feel, that I've got my color values more or less in check. But I can go back and you might say, well, is, no, it should be longer or shorter. That that's, doesn't matter. It matters from likeness. Doesn't, you don't know when you look at any museum and you look at Franz Hals or Lawrence or Sargent, I'm taking my <coughs> portraits now, if it looked like the person. Sir? Yes, sir. You said you're not going to flatter it, flatter it. You're flattering the daylights out of Germany. <laughs> 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 That's and with, the next and with good reason. <laughs> I want you to know I was threatened. There was a, there was a story about Frank Sinatra and uh, I've forgotten who the comedian was, I think Don Rickles. And Don Rickles and Sinatra had a long time feud. And Sinatra once promised he'd put his feet in cement because Rickles were making these comments about Sinatra's women and so forth. So one night they were interviewing Rickles and Rickles said, Sinatra, he saved my life. No kidding. Oh yeah, he saved my life. How come? He said, I thought you hated him. No, he saved my life. He said, I was coming out of a parking lot and he sent a couple of his goons after me and they're beating the hell out of me and Sinatra said, leave him alone, he's had enough. He saved my life. <laughs> That's why I'm being kind to him. <laughs> you know, technically, uh, and I want to mention this particular medium, I really like it. That's the, the heavy, what do you call it, the thicker one? It's your the Alkid medium. Yep. For me right now, the painting has got a nice plastic sense where it's not quite wet, it's not quite dry, but it's, you can move it in and out. Whereas if it's too wet, well that's why you get into things like canvas boards, uh, masonite, uh, all these different types of canvas. It all interests me. It's a question really what you want to achieve. Out of doors, I like a quick absorbing cotton, where the color just soaks in. And I do like this. I do like a single prime linen for portraits with a slight to it. I'm just taking a little white with a lizard because when you go into the ear to start to watch your drawing, there's a little more pink feeling. sensitive to color. So if you look at the um, jacket he's wearing, it's got a little more purple in it. But what I do is I then, if I have the value correct, this is really <coughs> what I'm trying to say to you. If you have the value correct, you can change the color. So, it, but you don't, as I, I don't have the ability or the genius that Soroya or Zorn did to just hit that color value right away. But I'm mixing up with my ultramarine blue and lizard and white a little bit of what I think is the right value. And then you begin to change your colors here, which this will look the same to you, but I promise you, when you begin to enlarge it, and you'll see there is a violet color coming through. Then so much of it, depending again on depends on your own personal taste as to where you what's that for? You know, I find I'm using a lot more terrarium in recent years, after 50 years. I'm using pointed brushes for grounds. 
I never used to use them ever, except for the watercolor. I don't know why, it just suddenly feels to me. Well, I said, if you can catch the simplicity and structure, structure, within his eye on that side, you were right on towards likeness. It's so subtle, because it's deeply set. And there is a highlight in there, but how light? I'm curious too. Jim, why don't you take a break and let me take some questions. I'd love some questions if you have on any kind of photography, whatever. Do any of you have any questions? Uh, hey, can it be? Oh, I thought you, I thought it, oh good to see you. Yeah, oh, good to see you. Yeah, I think great. of you very often. Yeah. Well, who was it who knew you so well? Was it Dave, Dave Pennant? Yeah, yeah, I still talk to him. Yeah, that's what he said. How are you doing? Is great. Joe here too? Yeah. And Robin. You're so good to come down from Tennessee. You're so good to make this trip. We talk My about pleasure. you guys so often. Yeah. How are you liking living out in the Oh, great. You don't miss the city? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to go back in October. Why? Comic, comic <laughs> convention. Okay. Go to the Comic Con. Why did you go to that? Because it's not showing. Fun. Well, you used to draw comics. Are you kidding? <laughs> Can you focus this I was good then. Yeah. You'd be surprised, Tom. The interest today. Only half of him is showing him. When he's painting, it's not really showing him very much when he's talking or anything. Is that a film? It's a video. You're not seeing him most of the time on the video. Are you going to be here for a minute? Well, Anthony's the one who's taking care of the video camera. I'm shooting the stills. Are you in your way? We all wanted to see what it looked like. Yeah, well, I, I'm sort of anxious to see what it looked like.